Now for some concepts, basic concepts. When we're dealing with dynamical systems, we need two fundamental things. One is a state description, and the other is a dynamic, which describes how that state changes over time. So exactly two things are needed. Neither of them is present in the world. Both of them are ways of framing our observations, as we'll see. So while the mathematics and the interpretive practices around dynamical system began with mechanics, in which the state was always the position and velocity simultaneously of a point mass, that is no longer the rest a restriction we need to consider. And one can look at any complex changing state of affairs as a dynamical system, if we can identify a state and a dynamic. So, for example, we might come observe a child on a swing, rocking back and forth. And then the having singled this out of the entire flux of the cosmos as the thing we're interested in, we might then attempt to capture what it is that we see about the child on a swing in a state description. And for that, it's not going to be important whether it's a boy or a girl, what, whether they're wearing a hat, whether their mother is there. Probably, if we're going to use these tools for a child in a swing, we're going to be interested in the position and velocity of the child as a pendular element at the end of a chain. Probably. You could choose something more challenging. Ireland's economy could be considered as a dynamical system. Hmm. If we can specify its state at any time and we can specify the way it changes over time. I hope you can see the problem here. There is no agreed definition of what the state of affairs of an economy is, which numbers should go in to describe the economy at any given moment. Now, we're not interested in piecemeal saying this variable and that variable, and I don't know, probably some others. If we want to use these tools, we need to be able to say what the state of the system is at time t. That's not going to happen for the economy. Likewise, your brain is obviously an enormously complicated thing and it's changing all the time. We do not know what numbers one would need to capture in order to describe either the state or the state evolution of your brain. Coming back to simple things, a falling marble presents a simpler kind of example. A real falling marble, falling down a real hill, still presents us with challenges. We can idealize a falling marble as a point mass, and we can apply the techniques of, and concepts of mechanics here. Um, specifying how a falling marble changes in the real world will require us to acknowledge the complexities of the real world, and a real marble going down a grassy knoll, for example, a hill, um, is actually extraordinarily complex, so it might be difficult to specify the dynamic unless we idealize. So idealization is an important part of what we're about. Now, a recurrent neural network is another thing that, well, in this case, we can say what its state is at time t, and furthermore, we're in charge of the rules, so we can specify the dynamic. We can say exactly how that state will change over time, assuming the data set on which it's going to be trained is a given. So those are different ways of framing our observations, and we need tools for talking about these and for recognizing when we can and cannot apply the tools of dynamic systems theory. And from several hundred years of work in the field, we have many, many such tools. There are experts around in the formal apparatus. The application of the formal apparatus to human living is still very much a work in progress. The differential calculus is at the heart of these, and you've probably all forgotten your differential calculus, haven't you? Everyone does. You learn it in school, and you're not told why it's important. They couldn't tell you at that stage why it's important. The differential calculus deals with continuous change in time, so it's not going to be relevant to our um, recurrent neural networks. It was relevant in the mathematics that justified the choice of activation functions and the development of, of 
error functions and so on, but when we're observing our recurrent network, it's a discrete dynamical system, and we use different tools for that. For a continuous system, we encounter this paradoxical notion of an instantaneous rate of change. That's not paradoxical in the case of a discrete dynamical system, where we say, here's a state of time one, here's a state of time two. Oh, look, it changed by this much, <laughs> because time has already been discretized. When we're dealing with continuous systems, the notion of an instantaneous rate of change is at the heart of those paradoxes we saw in the last video. And when we're describing change in one variable as a function of another variable, usually with respect to time, we've spatialized time in a peculiar way. Exactly the same vocabulary can allow us to describe change in one direction, the x direction, with respect to the y direction. So we can describe curvature in space using the same tools. And the instantaneous rate of change will turn out to bear a very important relationship to the notion of a tangent to a surface, so that is the angle formed when you place something on a curved surface. Now we're going to introduce these concepts without much reliance, if any, on equations. Equations sour the mood. Nobody likes them and everyone's forgotten the calculus. So I'm going to draw here heavily from um, this wonderful series, Dynamics to Geometry of Behavior. I think it might be out of print. Uh, unfortunately, but what it did was it introduced the topic of dynamical systems and in two volumes led you through to state-of-the-art graduate level mathematics, really, really difficult stuff without any equations whatsoever. Quite remarkable. It did it all using pictures. It's kind of the comic book of dynamics. So we're going to steal some of them pictures. Here's one. I love these illustrations. And it says, consider the waffle iron, the humble waffle iron. You come upon a waffle iron and you say, that is going to be the object of my inquiry. I'm going to inquire into this waffle iron. I'm going to model it as a simple system. Well, model what? I mean, I could take out my Lego and I could build a Lego waffle iron. And it would bear some correspondence to the waffle iron. But it's probably not going to be interesting as a model. I could draw the waffle iron. And again, it bears a correspondence of some important sort to the waffle iron, but it's going to be of no use probably in understanding what we might call the behavior of the waffle iron. And what do we mean by behavior? Well, we could jump ahead and say, obviously, in a waffle iron, we're interested in how it makes waffles. But a waffle iron exists. It comes into being somewhere in a factory in China, and it lives in your kitchen, and it goes out of being. And all of this is change in time. By selecting the um, specific variable of heat of the surface as relevant to cooking waffles, we have once more chosen to characterize this in one way rather than another. So we can talk about the behavior of the waffle iron and we can say that its temperature is probably going to be an important thing. If we want to understand the behavior of the waffle iron, we should probably model its, the changes in its temperature over time. But notice as with all behavioral descriptions, whether of humans, animals, or systems. Behavior is not something objective in the world. Behavior is a way of framing our observations that makes it clear what we are interested in a system and how we understand it as, in some sense, purposeful. So when I draw the waffle iron, the intended purposes of the waffle iron for cooking purposes find no acknowledgement. When I model its temperature changes, this is information that's relevant to its behavior in cooking waffles. So we could describe the state of a waffle iron in many ways, but given its function as a waffle iron, temperature is probably going to be a useful variable. And this is our first modeling decision, identifying what the state of the system is that's going to feature in our model. Happily, the temperature of the waffle iron can be expressed numerically. And furthermore, we can associate a reading, a temperature reading, with a point in time. So we can, for this waffle iron, for these purposes, say what the state is. The waffle iron is particularly simple. Here's George Washington. He's not a simple character. Um, we could choose to do something similar with George Washington. We could take his temperature over time. And 
it will correlate with some aspects of George Washington and will not correlate with others. George Washington is probably most famous as a certain as a president, right? And temperature will be correlated with his health, but if you're interested in the president, health is not your central concern. You're interested in things like power and economies and so on. And there um, the temperature is going to be a very poor index. It's not going to help. It probably correlates better with his health than his honesty, but it's a pretty poor way of viewing this system. Notice how complicated the world is and how as modelers we're trying to find just those aspects that find numerical expression in a measurable way that permit us to model some aspects of the world in accordance with our motivations. In both of these examples, we can proceed and we can generate what's called a state space. A state space is a foundational notion here. It's a very important notion. The state space allows us to make a mark um, corresponding to the state of a system. So we observe it. Temperature is our scale. And so every time we take a measurement, we identify one point on this one-dimensional state space. Because it's temperature, one could argue this, is, uh, this state space has specific properties. So it stops at absolute zero. It's bounded to the left and unbounded to the right. I don't know that there's a maximum temperature. I know our waffle iron will never reach it, but in theory, this state space is bounded on the left but not bounded on the right. That's the topology of this state space. Now, if we observe our waffle iron or George Washington over time, we get a sequence of measurements. And there shown on the left is a sequence of measurements. T0, T1, T2, and T3. Notice we're, in the, we're assuming that the underlying time is continuous, but we have chosen for specific points in time at which to take a measurement. And there's the four measurements. And just looking at the state space, if you just look at the left-hand side, your ability to say much is somewhat limited because we said nothing so far about how spaced out those measurements were in time. Time, oddly enough, has not yet entered the picture. We have not shown time. The state space does not indicate time. If we want to show time, we have to add it as an extra dimension. I've done that on the right-hand side, and now we can see that those four observations were equally spaced in time, and that therefore the state is evolving. It's de it's, the temperature is increasing, but decelerating. And we might assume, we might predict, perhaps, that it seems to be reaching, coming towards an asymptote. That's clearer from the right-hand plot, where we can see the curve flattening off. It's implicit in the left-hand plot if we know something about the intervals between the measurements. So that's a one-dimensional state space. A two-dimensional state space is very easy to construct. Consider, for example, the emotional state of a dog. I'm sure the emotional state of a dog is an enormously complicated thing. But we have animal ethologists, Conrad Lorenz and Christopher Zeman, for example, described a two-dimensional state space that is of use. Um, if we take note of the ear attitude, are the ears up or down or in the middle? And the fang exposure, is the dog showing its fangs or not showing its fangs? Then we end up with a state space. So if we encounter a dog, we can record these two variables plonk it down, plonk that observation down in this state space, and in this way we can track variation in the emotional state of a dog. Notice we've said nothing about the underlying reality of the situation. We have simply chosen variables which to us appear to be informative about the kind of question we're asking. Now, dogs are hard to figure out. Maybe we've got a system that's even harder to figure out. Maybe we've got a system that's a black box. We don't know what's inside. And we'd like to figure out maybe what's inside. This is frequently the question. Uh, frequently we have the choice of, when we come to a complex system, of black boxing it. That is, giving up on figuring out what's inside and simply working on measurements that are available from the outside. Here's the, in this black box we see two dials. That's two numbers, current and voltage in this case. Um, who knows what that box is doing, but we could take the, a, a, a reading at a given time of those two variables, 
as the state space of this box. So our state space is only ever a partial window into a real system, as you can see. A single observation of the dog or the black box gives us a single point in a two-dimensional space. So our state space here is planar, and depending on the um, system being observed, its topology may be an infinite plane or it may be a restricted plane, and we'll see other kinds of two-dimensional state spaces as we go along. Now, a single point in the state space represents a single observation at a single point in time. Over time, because we're dealing with changing systems, this system will move through state space and subsequent observations will pick out different points in time. Just as we saw for temperature, a sequence of observations will yield a trajectory in two-dimensional space. Now, this was not so obvious in the one-dimensional space where there's not a lot of room to move, but now we can see here a sequence of observations, five observations, picking out a trajectory in state space. And we will be very interested in these trajectories. And as before, time is not shown explicitly here. The state space describes the evolution of state over time, but it does that representation does not include time explicitly. To add time explicitly here, we have to show add a third dimension, and we can do that. There you go. It just got more complicated. Um, and we could always recreate the two-dimensional view from a more fulsome representation like this by swiveling that axis around and peering down and collapsing all those views like this guy is doing. So notice the left-hand side shows time explicitly. The right-hand side, by choosing a specific point of view, picks out the state space. One dimension, two dimension, of course our observations of the world and our characterization of any interestingly complex system will have many more numbers in it than this. Here's a three-dimensional characterization of George Washington that is still going to fail, I'm afraid, to support any really insightful model of George Washington. But we started with temperature, so we could also measure his blood pressure, assuming that was a single point, it's two measurements, of course, and pulse rate. And we could record this as a point in a three-dimensional state space. So we're not getting very far with George Washington, I have to admit. And we are dealing with formal tools that necessarily idealize. We recognize in George Washington a complexity that we don't hope to, to capture well with our model. Nonetheless, we've gone from a one-dimensional measurement to a three-dimensional measurement. If we can only get his taxes now, we might have more information that's of relevance. So you can see the notion of a state space generalizes one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions. Um, so we've now introduced the notion of state. And in the next video, we'll turn to the notion of the dynamic. And these two central concepts found the entire field of dynamical systems.